Okay. Hello, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, this is uh, the Wednesday show. I call it Wisdom Wednesdays because we're working our way through the Book of Wisdom called the Book of Proverbs. There's 31 chapters, and uh, we've done 11 chapters so far. They're already uploaded on my uh, YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. So uh, they're available if you want to go back and uh, look at those. But today we're going to begin with uh, chapter 12. But uh, first, if Brother Eric is still there, I'd like him to say hi and introduce himself. <laughs> uh, that takes me back, boy. Okay, uh, <laughs> that's all you need to know. Uh, okay, back to you. <laughs> okay, if you're the Lone Ranger, I must be Tonto. <laughs> okay. Who wants to be? I'm going to um, read it uh, like. Uh, chapter 12, a verse at a time. I'll read it first in the KJV because I'm a KJV firstist. Uh, and then I'm going to look at it also in the Amplified because the Amplified version amplifies and expounds upon the, the scripture. So let's do that. And uh, beginning with chapter 12, verse 1 in the KJV, it says, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge. But he that hateth reproof is brutish. Yeah. Yeah, now this is, uh, this is getting into some, uh, a, a subject that is very dear to my heart. Uh, you, see, uh, the Proverbs uh, was written by King Solomon, and he says he's writing it to his son so he can learn wisdom. But there are a number of recurring themes uh, within the book that uh, already in the first 11 chapters, we've seen these, these themes repeated several times. Uh, uh, one of them has been uh, uh, hanging out with the wrong people, getting in trouble, uh, uh, being seduced by uh, 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 you know, uh, the strange woman. And, uh, and there's, there's numerous topics like that that are recurring. And now we see the beginning of the topic of um, loving instruction. It is wise to love instruction. So brother here says, whoso loveth instruction, loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. What, what do you think of that? Uh, I love that verse uh, because it just, uh, Tells you how it is. Okay, back to you. Okay, um, I just put up a uh, a quotation that I have uh, I've been familiar with for about a year. I don't know who said this, but I put it on my um, on my YouTube channel where it says about, and then it, you tell about yourself. And I, I have my statement of faith up there, but I also put this statement up, and I'm going to read it now because it, it actually relates to this topic here. It says, uh, skepticism is the antiseptic of the mind. Remember why we debate. We have nothing to lose but the errors we hold. But who but a stubborn fool would hold on to errors once they have been exposed? Um, and so this is this goes right along with that uh, line of thinking in Proverbs that uh, we should be willing to listen to people, people who disagree with us. And I see this as a uh, quality, a, a virtue that is as greatly lacking in the body. I, I have a playlist called Dogmatists, and it's addressing this as, as a serious problem in the body that some, some people, they, they come to conclusions, the minor doctrines, 
and they don't want to listen to anybody else on it if they have a different opinion on it and they get angry and uh, start calling people names be because they disagree. But the wise thing to do, as it says here in Proverbs, is we listen and we will be, accept reproof, accept correction. And I'm happy to say that uh, I've been corrected over the years on a few theological topics. I held a position. I was willing to listen to people who had a different viewpoint. I was trying to be fair and really consider what they had to say. And on a few occasions, they changed my mind. And I moved from one side of the argument to the other side. And I think that is a virtue to listen. And that's what it's telling us here in, in Proverbs. Uh, I'll read it again and see if you want to expound on that uh, any further, brother, but it's, uh, it says, Whoso loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. And uh, I've observed that uh, people, some people just don't like being told uh, advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people, they love it. And uh, according to scriptures, uh, there's your distinction between wise and foolish. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I uh, also have a part of my statement of faith. that It says, um, in essentials, unity. Let's unify around the essentials, the core doctrines. Uh, in in, uh, in non-essentials, liberty. Let's give people the freedom on non-essentials to disagree and, and hold different varying viewpoints. And it would be wise when you encounter someone who holds a different viewpoint on you, whether it's uh, eternal torment or Bible trans, tra which translations are true or, or how the end is coming about, the eschatology, or a wide number of other things. When you find someone who disagrees with you on these things, it would be wise for you to hear them out. And try to learn something. And it says here, uh, skepticism is the antiseptic of the mind. Antiseptic is something that cleans up some, some, uh, some uh, like a, an infection, something that's bad in there. It gets rid of it. Uh, so we should uh, be, be skeptical uh, whenever we're taught something by anybody. Don't just take it and accept it immediately. Be skeptical, investigate it, and, and, and then investigate all sides of the argument be, before you come to some conclusions, and particularly if you come to a conclusion and then you want to get dogmatic on that and start acting like, thus saith the Lord, you know, uh, it's a pre-tribulation rapture or, you know, something like that. So let's be skeptical before we come to conclusions. Let's examine it. It says, remember why we debate. We have nothing to lose but the errors we hold. Now, to me, that's a beautiful, beautiful uh, principle. If I am in error, I don't want to remain in error, brother. If you ever think I'm in error, please do me a favor as my friend and brother. Tell me, Brother Luke, I think you're wrong, and this is how I see it. And with respect and courtesy, we discuss it, we debate it, and, and if I... Uh, the only thing I have to lose from debating the uh, an issue like that is I might lose my error, and I want to lose the error if I'm wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Amen to that. Okay, you got a deal. Okay, and uh, the um, you know in in um, the book of Proverbs, uh, I don't know how many times the word fool is comes up, but I bet you in 31 chapters it comes up a hundred times, and, and uh, uh, right here in this quotation I gave you here, it says, who but a stubborn fool would hold on to errors once they have been exposed? Yeah, if I'm in error, expose it. I, will, I don't want to be a fool and hold on to an error once, you, once you've shown me I'm wrong. Okay, let's look at this uh, same first verse, Proverbs 1, 1 in the Amplified and see if we learn anything more. It says, whosoever loves instruction and correction loves knowledge, but he who hates reproof is like a brute beast, stupid and indiscriminating. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 
I agree with everything it said. <laughs> All right, let's go back to it now. Proverbs 12, verse 2. A good man obtaineth favor, favor of the Lord, but a wicked man devices will be will he condemn. But but a wicked a, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn, it says. Uh, a good man. So this is the same principle that we've talked about uh, previously about when we do good, when we follow commandments, when we do wise things, we get good results back to us. It's the law of reaping and sowing. Uh, but, but when you do wicked things, you make wicked plans, you do wicked acts, then uh, you're, you're not going to end up ahead in the end. You're going to suffer from the law of cause and effect. And it says he will condemn you. So brother, verse two, what do you say about that? Uh, I love that verse. And uh, it really, uh, it really uh, draws the line between uh, one side and the other. You know, a good man, will have the favor of the Lord and the wick, a man of wicked devices, uh, he'll be condemned. Mm -hmm. And that's just uh, the bottom line. We're on a bunch of bottom line uh, proverbs. <laughs> yeah. And so this should be um, an encouragement and a warning to us. Uh, if you do good, God's going to be blessing you. That's a good, a great encouraging thing for us to uh, say, hey, make an effort to do the right things, and God, God will, will give you blessings. Uh, and be careful. If you start doing the wrong things, there will be consequences. You're not going to get away with doing bad things. Uh, let's see that in the, in the Amplified, verse 2. A good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of wicked devices he condemns. There's no difference there. Okay, we'll go on to verse 3. A man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of righteous, the root of the righteous shall not be moved. A man shall not be established by wickedness but the root of the righteous shall be moved. Uh, is that pretty much saying the same thing as the previous verse, brother? Oh, that pretty much concerned, confirms my previous statement that these are all bottom liners, and mm. that this specifically is addressing a bottom liner uh, situation. Uh -huh. The root. Yeah. Um, well, man shall be established but the root of righteousness. Well, we we know that later uh, in the scriptures, you know, uh, we we understand what this root of righteousness is. It is a person, Jesus Christ, um, and uh, so this was written before the New Testament. But if we to give a New Testament application to this, the root of righteousness shall not be moved. So. Brother, you have Jesus Christ uh, uh, living in you. You are in Christ, and Christ is in you, the scripture says. And so you have this root of righteousness. So you are a righteous man because you have the righteousness of Jesus Christ dwelling in you. Um, and it says you shall not be moved. Uh, I'm not sure what shall not be moved means, but I think it's a, it's a good thing. Let me look at that in the Amplified. A man shall not be established by his wickedness, by wickedness, but the root of the uncompromisingly righteous shall never be moved. <clears throat> well, if it's talking about a root being moved, maybe it's a root being uprooted, pulled up. I don't know. Any idea? So you're saying, you're saying Jesus is the bottom line. Yeah. That's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Jesus won't be moved. Jesus won't be moved. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, look at verse four. It says, "A virtuous and worthy wife." Oh, oops, sorry. I got to go to KJV first. 
A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Wow. Man. They will find that this is going to be also a recurring theme. He, Solomon talks a lot about uh, you know, good wives and bad wives, you know, the blessing of a good wife and the curse of having a bad wife. And uh, boy, there's a lot of interesting things. He's, we'll, we'll hear about that later. But this is the first I've seen about it. A virtuous woman is a crown to her husband, but she that maketh ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. <laughs> Solomon has a way with words, doesn't he? Yeah, talk about changing gears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, if you have a virtuous wife, then you are very, very blessed. And uh, your, your life will be blessed because of it with a lot of good things. Uh, but if you have a, a wife that uh, uh, makes you ashamed because she's not virtuous, then this will have the effect on you like your bones have become rotten. That's how sick it will make you if you have the wrong wife, a wife that's not virtuous and a blessing. Brother, I know you love your wife very much. I, 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 I've heard you refer to her a few times. And I know that she is a big priority in your life. And uh, so I, I figure that you must have the, the first wife, the virtuous wife. Um, yes. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I do praise God. And all, all women who are in Christ and are married are virtuous wives, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Well, yes. Uh, they they are virtuous in their respect of their uh, uh, they're a child of God if they're a daughter of God they're uh, uh, saved they're indwelled with the Holy Spirit but it doesn't mean that that wife is always going to be conducting herself in a way that that makes you happy and sometimes a wife even when she's a, a Christian some Christian wives are uh, make their husband's bones feel rotten. That's how you get, you get sick if your wife is uh, behaving in a way that like it, having a bad wife, even if she's a Christian, and this is, goes both ways, if a wife has a husband that's saved, but for example, I, I knew a young man that was a street preacher. He started preaching with me and I kind of took him under my wing and he and his wife came to our Bible study for like seven years. And, but the way he treated her was just made me sick and it made her sick. And, and uh, finally it's all unraveled and, and uh, uh, there she's, she's divorced him because he's so abusive. But he told her one time when we were out preaching and he was out there on the sidewalk holding a big banner and she, she wandered off of maybe about uh, 15 feet away from him. And I heard him yell out, you come over here and stand right next to me. I told you, you better obey me. <laughs> and I, I walked over to him and I said, you talk to your wife like she's a dog. I said, I, bet, I don't want to ever hear you talk like that to her again. You're, you're not going to be part of this ministry. And he even told her that um, for a while he was requiring her to not call him by his name but call him Lord. What? Yeah. He, <laughs> she had to call him Lord because he noticed in the scriptures that. Uh, um, okay. Sarah, yeah. Sarah, I know what he's talking about. Sarah called Abraham Lord. So he thought his wife must call him Lord. Uh, and there are some husbands. So this is, could be either way. This happens right now to be talking about uh, a virtuous wife or a bad wife comparing it. A uh, virtuous wife is a blessing. A bad wife is a curse. It'll make you sick, even your bones sick. And uh, But it goes the other way, too. I've seen where 
why wives have horrible husbands and it's a curse on them. Um, let's read this in the uh, Amplified, verse 4. A virtuous and worthy wife, earnest and strong in character, is a crowning joy to her husband, but she who makes him ashamed is as rottenness in his bones. Yeah. Very true. Well, brother, I'm, you and I are, are indeed are blessed to have wonderful wives. They're blessings to us. The good character and virtuous wives. That, uh, uh, it's really uh, one of the great blessings you can get in your life as a good wife or a good spouse. Uh, let's go to verse 5. KJV, the thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this uh, helps us to understand that on one hand, in verse 1, it says, Whosoever loveth instruction loveth knowledge, but he that hateth reproof is brutish. So it's telling us that we should be willing to listen and, and, and receive instruction. But on the other hand, it's saying, it says here in verse 5, the thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceit. So it is possible to get counsel from the wicked. And that's, uh, it's up to us to listen to the righteous and the wicked and then try to discern and um, use good judgment and try to determine if this is good counsel or not. Just because someone gives us counsel doesn't mean we are obligated to follow the counsel. Sometimes it's, it's evil. It's, uh, it's, as I've said, it's deceitful. Have you ever experienced a good, good uh, counsel and deceitful evil counsel? Uh, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact... I certainly have, and uh, I could uh, really tell you uh, some stories about that one, <laughs> because uh, 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 bad bad advice can really screw you up. Yeah, so it's very important. Yeah, that's why on on one hand we want to be willing to listen. But we don't want to be a fool just following everybody's advice, uh, you know, uh, uh, necessarily without, without weighing it out and considering the validity of it. Uh, but we shouldn't be quick to dismiss people. If someone has something to say to us and they want to correct us or give us advice, uh, it's wise to listen. But it's not wise to necessarily follow all the advice you receive. I've had to do that a few times where, uh, I have one person in mind right now. I won't mention it, the name, but uh, this person wanted to correct me on various occasions, and I, I always listened. And, and uh, uh, there's there were times where I said, "Well, I, I I I'm glad you told me that, but I don't agree with you on this. Uh, I, I'm not persuaded that you're right." And then there, I remember one case where he he was correcting me. And uh, I said, okay, I think you're, you're right on this. And I made a change. So uh, on one hand, we want to be listening. We want to open, be open-minded and listen to people and, and fairly consider what they have to say. Uh, but we're not obligated. We're not obligated. It's just everybody, every time someone wants to correct us, that say, okay, we're, we're going to follow their correction, you know. Okay, let's go to um, let's see verse 5 and the Amplified first. Verse 5. The thoughts and purposes of the consistently righteous are honest and reliable, but the counsels and designs of the wicked are treacherous. Yeah, that's, that's helpful. That's just telling us very clearly there that they're, you know, um, you're going to receive some counsel. If people are going to advise you and correct you in your life, uh, but be careful. 
some of the advice you're going to get is coming from a person who's wise and righteous. And sometimes you're going to get advice from people who are wicked and treacherous. (laughs) Okay, let's go to verse 6 in the KJV. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. Hmm. Have you ever had any, been acquainted with people like that? Uh, the uh, the first one. Um. Yes, absolutely. Uh, pe- the people have. Oh my gosh, the man, people that work for the devil, they actively. Uh, they, there's murdering spirits out there that are actively trying, always actively trying to kill Christians. And they, they're always trying to knock me off. Eventually they will, uh, but uh, until then, uh, uh, it's too bad for them. Uh, give them the gospel uh, and uh, just uh, be aware of it. Uh, watch out for yourself. Yeah. Well, I could re- recall this uh, idea first coming up. I think it was Proverbs chapter 1, where it talks about uh, don't associate with people who just want to lead you into trouble and go, uh, just out to, you know, they're out for blood. And uh, they want to you know, lie, cheat, and steal and rob people and hurt people. And uh, you, you just, you've got to avoid people like that. And so, again, this one says it very graphically. Uh, the words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood. So there are wicked people that uh, they're just planning and waiting for an opportunity to draw blood. They want to hurt people. They want to, you know, beat them or kill them and then take what they have. They're evil. And uh, they, they, when these people, their words, uh, it starts with words usually. So don't listen to these people and don't let them influence you. But the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. So it's it's really boils down to associations again. You know, I've I've had a lot of bad associations in my life, and then some people could probably. Uh, say the same thing but having me in mind because uh, maybe I was a bad influence on them I mean uh, I I don't need to go into all the details and make some public confession now but uh, the first uh, until I was about well 36 years old uh, I was 35 then it was December of 1986, I was 36 years old when I got saved. Before that point, um, I did a lot of things that should, you know, I could have very easily ended up in prison or, or dead. And uh, so I probably would have been under that first category, the wicked person. Uh, not that I was out for blood to beat people or kill people, but I did bad things. And uh, so where we're told don't associate with people like that. And I, I made that mistake in my youth and uh, I went along with the gang and, and uh, did and did the things that they were doing. Uh, I didn't have the Holy Spirit to, to change me and to guide me at that time. So I was just being guided by my flesh. Uh, but um, I know I, I'm very fortunate. I've, I think even before I got saved that God had something in mind for me in terms of uh, um, he knew that I was going to put my faith in him um, because of his foreknowledge. And he probably protected me a lot of times because uh, I've got a long list of friends I could tell you that are dead or in prison. And uh, thank you, Jesus. I'm, I'm not, I'm not there, but I very well could have been there with them. So I was fortunate to, get through all that and uh, be able to look back on it and, and, and say, wow, I was very fortunate. I don't like to be lucky. A lot of times people, when something really good happens to you, they say, oh, you're really lucky. 
No, luck, luck is for the unsaved world. That they, they, they think it's, everything is just a matter of luck, good luck or bad luck. But when good things happen to us, but brother, I, I don't think it's luck. I think it's blessings. And so uh, I was, uh, God was looking out for me. I wasn't as lucky to survive it. I'm into that. Uh, yes, uh, that's absolutely uh, astounding how uh, the Lord uh, preserves and protects us uh, supernaturally. Uh, and thank God for that supernatural intervention of God on our behalf. Yeah, I'm glad you, you used that word supernaturally. I remember once I had a party at my house. And I had a mixed crowd. I had some older friends that uh, not necessarily uh, all of them were saved. And, and then the newer friends that were all part of my ministry and my Bible studies. And, and uh, one of my older friends was telling stories about me when I was younger. And he says, I can't believe what's, how Luke has changed. And, you know, and, and, and uh, one of the, <laughs> one of the guys that was a street preacher with me at that time, he says, it's, you know, isn't that amazing how much he's changed? He's gone from one extreme all the way to another extreme. It's just, it doesn't seem natural, does it? He said, no, it's not natural. And he says, it's not natural. It's, it's, it's supernatural. Amen. <laughs> change, the change in me was supernatural. Uh, Amen. I didn't even try to change because the Holy Spirit has been doing the work of transforming me. And uh, I'm sure he's got a lot of work left to do, but the change was obvious to my old friends. And they, yes. it was hard for them to understand it. It had to be explained. It's not a natural thing, but what Luke's, this change in Luke, it's supernatural. It's the Holy Spirit that's changing it. Supernatural. The new creation. Yeah. The new creation is here now. That's right, brother. All right. I'm going to look at verse uh, uh, 7 in the Amplified now. Uh, it says, uh, The wicked are overthrown and are not, but the house of the uncompromisingly righteous shall stand. Okay. Again, it's just that contrast of you know you're bl you're blessed when you do good and you're you're uh, cursed when you do bad. Uh, let's look at verse eight in the KJV. A man shall be commended according to his wisdom, but he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. Mm -hmm. Well, that's what we're after today, isn't it, brother? Wisdom? Yeah. I, um, I think that it's uh, fair for me to commend you. It says, a man shall be commended according to his wisdom. Uh, I haven't known. When did we first uh, become acquainted, brother? Uh, oh, yeah. Well, that's uh, probably a long story. Uh, <laughs> we did uh, have some little uh, complications at the beginning due to my uh, uh, well, it's hard to explain my behavior here on YouTube. Uh, last couple of years has been uh, uh, not taken uh, in the right spirit. Uh, even though I've done everything out of love, uh, people were often offended uh, by the things I've said. Uh, misinterpretations, mostly. But uh, we had a little spat, uh, you may not recall. And uh, thank God for people with short memories. That's what I always say. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, 
it's just like the, the scriptures say about God's attitude towards us. He says that your sins and iniquities, I will remember no more. Now, I've cast your sins as far as the east is from the west. So um, that's what we do when we uh, forgive each other. If, you, if we feel that we've been wrong and, uh, uh, you know, then uh, when we forgive, we should just not, it should not be a memory. But the, uh, I think that uh, it's probably been about a year or so since I first uh, started talking to you. And I would say that uh, my, my respect for you and your wisdom has really grown a lot over that time. And you, you're, uh, um, so I, I think this verse here, uh, can apply to you because it says uh, a man of wisdom can, can be commended. So I, I think I can commend you because I believe you are a wise saint. Um, and I, well, I thank you. Most people don't see it yet, <laughs> but they will. <laughs> and yeah, I love your sense of humor too, brother. Uh, so when it says it, uh, um, A man shall be commended according to his wisdom. So uh, if nobody has commended you for it yet, brother, then at least today you are commended. And he that, he that is of a perverse heart shall be despised. Uh, I guess that's just a natural result, the result when people are perverse. Uh, other people are going to end up despising them. So it, if you don't want to be despised, don't be perverse. Uh, um, let's see what it says in the Amplified in verse 8. A man shall be commended according to his wisdom, godly wisdom, which is comprehensive insight into the ways and purposes of God. But he who is of a perverse heart shall be despised. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go to verse 9 in the KJV. He that is despised and hath a servant is better than he that honoreth himself and lacketh bread. Brother, can you translate that for me? That sounded like a foreign language to me. <laughs> uh, let me tell you what that means. That means that uh, the uh, micromanaging boss that everybody hates is better off than the guy that is wise in his own conceit, that thinks he knows it all. And, and he's honoring himself because, well, it doesn't say uh, he's honoring, why he's honoring himself. I, I, I assumed it was because he was, he, they were talking about the, the people that are wise in their own conceit. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? I, I don't know, and it says, and lack of the bread, so I'm, I'm, it, it, I'm a little confused. I think you're on to the right, the right thoughts here, but let's look at it in the Amplified. Maybe that'll help us. Verse 9, better is he who is lightly esteemed but works for his own support than he who assumes honor for himself and lacks bread. <laughs> okay. Well, that certainly is easy to understand, isn't it? Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, I'm just going to plug in my charger uh, to my iPhone. Uh, is my camera still working? Yeah. yeah I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, working very well. Okay. So uh, in the Amplified, uh, <laughs> if you're someone that's lightly esteemed, in other words, you're not being recognized. People are not acknowledging you or recognizing the good things you do, but you're working for your own support. Then that's more commendable than someone who is uh, uh, honoring themselves, is, is a self uh, righteous, uh, full of self esteem, and lacks bread. He, in other words, he's, he's not even working, he thinks he's all smart. But he's not even working and supporting himself. So. 
What are you doing with your phone? What are you doing with your phone? What's going on? Are we good? Are we good? Okay. Uh, we're on verse 9. Yeah. I just read it in the Amplified, and it, uh, it says, Better is he who is lightly esteemed, but works for his own support than he who assumes honor for himself and lacks bread. So in other words, you could be all full of yourself and full of self-esteem and thinking you're all that, and but you don't even have a job and can't even support yourself. <laughs> but how about the person that is not highly esteemed, you know, maybe he's not full of conceit and nobody even recognizing how good he is at all, but he's a hard worker and he's supporting himself. That person is far better off. Okay, uh, I've been accused of uh, that by my family because uh, I'm in between jobs right now. Um, sometimes my family uh, are disobedient and aren't keeping the royal law of love because uh, they don't have uh, great faith in the Lord uh, yet. Uh, some of them just don't believe yet, and they're my family, and I love them, and I want them to, uh, I believe that Jesus is going to save them, and so I'm believing, and so they'll accuse you of all sorts of things. Um, a lot of times it's not true. Uh, okay, enough of that. Yeah, well, on one hand, the first part of that verse talks about uh, who is, a man who is lightly esteemed. People don't esteem him. And maybe he doesn't even esteem himself. He's humble. Uh, but then the other person, he assumes honor for himself. So he has all kinds of self-esteem. And I've talked in the past about uh, the difference between being uh, self-conscious and Christ-conscious. Uh, and and uh, every time you have self in front of a word, it ruins it, like self-esteem. People today are thinking that we've got to give all the children self-esteem. But self-esteem is another word of saying pride. And the scriptures say that pride is a sin. Um, the opposite of pride or self-esteem, self-esteem is to think very highly of yourself. Well, the opposite of that is humility. And humility is considered a virtue, but pride and self-esteem is, is considered uh, sinful. And if you put self in front of another word, like confidence, people say you need self-confidence. Well, it can be helpful, I guess, in trying to achieve certain things if you have confidence, but uh, particularly concerning salvation, you better not put any confidence in yourself because you have to understand that uh, we are failures at salvation. A man cannot get to heaven through their own efforts. Don't put your confidence in your own ability to work your way to heaven. Instead, put your confidence in Christ. So not self-confidence, but Christ's confidence, confidence in him. Uh, as the same thing as reliance. People said people need to learn to be self-reliant. Well, that's talking about the first part of the verse, the man who's look, not highly esteemed, but he, he has a job, and he's working and supporting himself. So he's, he, he is self-reliant. He's able to take care of himself. But when it comes to salvation, we don't want to rely on ourselves. We don't want to think that we're, uh, uh, salvation is based upon what we do. We want to rely on Christ for our salvation. Rely on him. Trust him. Depend on him. Uh, so every time I see the word self, self-confidence, self-esteem, self-righteousness, self-righteousness, what's that? When a person thinks that they're really a good person and that they're, if they're, they might even be good enough to deserve heaven, that's self-righteousness. But instead we have to say, no, the scripture says my righteousness, even as good as I think I am, it doesn't even rise to this, this level of uh, what God requires. God says, my righteousness is like filthy rags in his sight. So we need to stop that being self-righteous and instead get the Christ righteousness. 
by putting our faith in Christ, Christ puts his righteousness on us, and then we're considered righteous. So this word self, and that's that's why this uh, this set me off on that, because this verse is talking about here. Um, well, I'm not done setting you off on that yet. Um, now, as far as myself is concerned, <laughs> <laughs> I've never lacked any bread, even though I am between jobs. I have more bread than uh, all those who accuse me. I think they're just jealous because um, um, I get this vacation time, uh, and God has supernaturally uh, provided for me. And, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, that's... Uh... Uh, and, you know, the scriptures tell us that, uh, you know, we just trust the Lord and he'll, he'll uh, give us the desires of our hearts. Uh, and Jesus said, don't worry. And, you know, if, if God will feed the, uh, the birds, he's certainly going to feed you. Uh, so there's no reason to worry. And you're a, a living example. Even though you're not working, God continue to provide your needs. You're not going hungry. And um, God will always provide our needs. But sometimes there's a difference between our wants and our needs. And uh, sometimes we want things, and, but we don't necessarily need it. And uh, sometimes we want things, but it's not really what God wants for us. Our, our wants and desires are not in line with what God wants and desires for us. So um, all those things uh, are part of part of this whole uh, concept. Let's go to verse 10 in KJV. A righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. Wow. I love this verse. This is one of my favorite verses in the Bible wow. because it talks about a righteous man. He, he thinks about his animals, his critters. And then uh, the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. You see that all the time on YouTube, everywhere in, in the world, how the wicked are, are mean to each other uh, uh, in a way that's, uh, that's their tender, loving kindness to each other. When they're mean to each other, uh, that's how they love each other. Uh, Do you have okay. pets? I do have a dog, uh, somebody... Uh, uh, abandoned and I took up. Uh, he's really not my dog, but I've been taking care of it for somebody. How long have you been taking care of him? Uh, a couple of years now. And uh, <laughs> I think it's, <laughs> say it's your dog now. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, that's the way it works. Okay, great. We did the same thing with uh, two cats. So we we had a, a, a little dog and two cats, and the cats uh, belonged to my son. Uh, but at a, a certain point, uh, he, he wasn't uh, able to take care of them, and so we took them. And we, we've, there, I guess there are cats. We've had them for like many years now. One of them, the little dog and the cat, uh, are buried in my backyard now. Um, and then uh, there's one surviving cat, now, my wife is the one that the cat is always, she and the cat are really close. And my wife's been gone for six weeks now. She'll be back next week. But all this time, I've had to take care of the cat. And uh, this, this verse here is kind of uh, pricking my conscience a little bit because uh, I'm taking care of him, okay. And he's very needy. He wants a lot of attention more attention than I really want to give him. But uh, uh, maybe I better give him more attention now that I've read that verse, a little more a little more love and kindness instead of just providing his food and water and stuff, you know. Well, don't let it bother you too much. Uh, I'm, I'm by, by nature, I'm not really a, an animal person, and uh, I, I've got to learn myself how to treat animals. Uh, and I, I have people... Uh, that work for me that uh, help me uh, uh, treat, treat my animals properly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my 
younger sister is different than me. Uh, uh, I don't know. She has in her house over the years. She's always had dogs and cats, and sometimes she probably has as many as ten of them. And um, uh, I thought I've always thought she's gone too far with it, but she rescues them. And anytime there's a stray, she has to rescue it. And she's had huge medical bills that she's paid for all these animals over the years too. And and uh, but she and her daughter love these animals, and they they often said that. Animals are far better than people. <laughs> Who is this? My my younger sister believes that. Oh, and, that's my older sister. Is an animal rescue in Arkansas. Uh huh. Uh, and I I tell you, I mean, overall, the pets they really are more loyal than than the friends I've had in my life, and they are also, um, you know. You, Many of them are a lot more affectionate and just, they're really, some of these dogs and cats, they do have a lot of really good qualities and, and even virtue. And even people, they've, I've heard it that said that um, if someone's old and alone, if, you, if they have a pet, that pet can add years to their life uh, because of giving them companionship. And even people who are sick, really sick, giving them a pet, it has some kind of healing qualities to have, have an animal. Um, uh, just the, 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 the touch. Do you, you know that there are actually some people that don't get any contact with other people? They never get touched or hugged, and they're lonely. And, and I think I saw a thing on TV many years ago about babies. And what they did was they did tests on babies where they, certain babies were touched a lot right after they're born, and, and, and then other babies were purposely not touched. And there was a dramatic difference in the, in the way these, uh, the health and the way the babies felt. People need contact. And if you don't get it from another human being, a loving embrace, then having an animal uh, on your lap and petting it helps both you and the animal. It's, it's good for your health. So um, I think that uh, Solomon is, uh, it's, he's on to something here talking about how we should be, you know, kind to the, our, our animals. Amen. And I've heard of, uh, I'm familiar with everything you just mentioned, and uh, I wholeheartedly agree with you uh, uh, on everything you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. Let's see verse 10 in the, in the Amplified and see what it says. A consistently righteous man regards the life of his beast, but even the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. <laughs> the wicked person is, uh, if you're a wicked person, you have a pet. You know, even if you think you're being nice to the pet, you probably end up being cruel, I guess. Um, the uh, Verse 11 in the KJV, He that telleth his land shall be satisfied with bread, but he that followeth vain persons is void of understanding. Hmm. What do you think of that, brother? Well, that's talking about the promise uh, uh, that uh, uh, a man shall be satisfied by the labor of his hands. If, if you work... There's a reward for working. But uh, now some people follow up their vain persons. And vain persons are, uh, according to scriptures, they're void of understanding. Because mm -hmm. they're vain. And mm -hmm. they're, they void understanding. Okay, it's pretty cut and dry. We're, we're back to the base. We're still on baseline uh, proverbs. And uh, I was... I'm just kind of uh, taken off by the wh where it uh, went on a tangent on verse uh, uh, verse ten four verse four went on a tangent and then verse five came right back uh, to the the topic and so that that was kind of weird yeah it, it's true well, uh, even uh go ahead man. It's true, though, that uh, we're not uh, islands to ourselves. Uh, when we're married, uh, everything our spouse does affects us. 
-hmm. Yeah, what, one of the things that uh, people have to understand about uh, all the different books of the Bible is that uh, you have one book, the last book, which is called an apocryphal book. It's, it's uh, written in a, in a style of writing that's called apocryphal, and they were in there like the, the oh, they're for about two or three centuries before Christ, a lot of the uh, rabbis wrote various apocryphal books. And they were, not, uh, they were not considered scripture or inspired by God, but it was a style of writing that's uh, very symbolic and uh, dramatic, like watching some fantastic you know, play play out. But it was, it was not literal and, and a lot of symbolism was subject to all kinds of interpretations. That's apocryphal. But then the, the rest of the Bible really is, is not like that at all. It, it's to be taken literal as a history book. Uh, the, it's, it's a record of historical events that are all true. Um, but then we get to the book of Proverbs, and it's, it's not a history story. It's, they're called Proverbs because a lot, many times the one verse stands on its own as a proverb. A proverb could be just one single verse, and um, it's in that class of verses called Proverbs, where it's a wise statement within one verse. So in, in a, within a chapter, sometimes you see uh, very, uh, maybe three or four or five or ten verses that are related, and then it totally changes to something else. So you don't think that by going to one particular chapter, it's always going to be about the same theme throughout. And even within the chapter, you might have one verse or another verse inserted in different places like we see in this chapter that don't seem to go along with the theme of the rest of the chapter. Okay, that's what's going on here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so let's go to uh, verse uh, 12. The wicked desireth the net of the evil of evil men but the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit i have no idea what that is saying there I oh hope. i know what it's saying okay brother <laughs> okay the wicked desires the net of evil men uh meaning uh they want to be like uh the the people they admire who are uh, doing things that are uh, uh, entrapping people, like uh, getting people to uh, sign for uh, bad loans, for example, uh, and wicked practices like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but. Uh, the root of the righteous yieldeth fruit. And uh, as you pointed out, uh, the root is Jesus Christ. And uh, if we're, if we have the root, if we're in, if we're a part of the root, it, then uh, we will, we will yield fruit. Uh-huh. Okay. Okay. Let me look at that in the Amplified and see if it elaborates any further. Twelve. Uh, the wicked desire the booty of evil men. Uh, but the root of the uncompromisingly righteous yields richer fruitage. Yeah. Okay, so in other words, if you're wicked, uh, you know, you think you may think that you're going to get uh, ahead. And, uh, but it, it's, it's just, it's, um, it's not going to work because we know that bad actions end up giving bad consequences. But in this case, it says the contrast is the root of the righteous yields richer fruitage. It's far better. You're going to get farther ahead by being righteous and doing the right things. I'll give you an example. Um, uh, brother, do you, do you have any uh, knowledge and skills in auto mechanics? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Okay. I have almost zero. Uh, I've tried to 
do a few things on my own over the years, but every time I've tried to do it, I end up breaking something and having a worse problem. And so I, I don't have that. So I've always had to rely on an auto mechanic. And I've had some friends over the years that I've trusted and they've helped me. But, in, but when I haven't had that benefit, I have to go to a mechanic and pay them. And I'm at their mercy uh, because I find that many of them are dishonest and want to take advantage of people if they're ignorant on mechanics. Uh, but when you find an, an honest mechanic, it's, it's such a blessing. To me, it's a, an asset in life. It's one of the great things to have is I have an honest mechanic, so I don't have to worry that I'm going to be cheated. And, uh, and that honest person, the word spreads because I tell people about them, about them and then other people tell about because it's, it's hard to find one. And when you, when you find one, the word spreads. And guess what? The honest mechanic ends up prospering. And because instead of making more money by cheating people, he makes even more money by everybody wanting to have an honest mechanic. Amen. And uh, that was a good example. But I was thinking that uh, a better example that you gave earlier uh, when you stood up to that guy that was mistreating his wife and that you wouldn't put up with that. And I was very, uh, admired that greatly. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. Thank you, brother. Um, now let's go to verse uh, uh, 13. Verse 13, the wicked is scared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. What is a transgression of lips? A transgression of the lips? Yeah. Well, um... I had to relocate my phone uh, to an outlet because for some reason the USB port wasn't charging it. Oh, okay. So I don't have my, I don't have my, my Bible's in the other room. Okay. Um, what does that say? Let me read it again here uh, carefully. It says, uh, uh, the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips. Okay. Okay. The wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips. Well, I'm drawing a blank right now. That's something you could really meditate on, though, I suppose. Uh, right off the hand, uh, I was thinking maybe it's talking about uh, when you say stupid stuff. And uh, you smart for it. Uh, there's lots of proverbs that talk about that. Uh, yeah. How well, how when we say stupid stuff, uh, we really get in trouble. Yeah. Uh, I transgression of his lips. That means there's something you said. Uh, and so, what are the bad things people can say? Well, some of the things we say they're bad or lies, and some of the bad things we we say are gossip. Some of the bad things we say are just mean and cruel and mean-spirited things. So when you say you have a transgression of the lips, uh, it says you'll be smeared. In other words, you're, you're going to be caught in your lies. You're going to be caught in your lies. You're going to be caught in your uh, 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 mean-spirited, uh, um, hateful, hateful things you say. It's going to come back and catch you. And uh, so don't, don't say those things. You end up going to be caught. Uh, but it says, the, but the just shall come out of trouble. So, uh, again, uh, you have a contrast here. That's a, that's a, a technique that uh, Solomon uses here in this writing over and over again. He has a contrast between one person and a different kind of person. When one person gets a bad result, the good person gets a good result. Let's see what, uh, if I'm right on that, on verse 13, we'll look at that in the Amplified. It says, the wicked 
is dangerously snared by the transgression of his lips, but the righteous shall come out of trouble. Uh, that doesn't really tell us anything more, does it? What do you think? Do you think that uh, the way I explained it, does it make sense or not? Well, I was just wondering if there's any rhyme and reason to these the contradicting prose style. Has anybody figured out if there's a a, a sequence, uh, some sort of uh, uh, some sort of a sequence that uh, is going on with that? I think, think it's just it's a it's a, a very good teaching technique. Uh, he's teaching. Okay. He's teaching his son wisdom, and when you you show them, look, if you do this, this bad stuff's going to happen to you. On the other hand, if you do this, you will get good things happening to you. Over and over again, you can do this or you can do that. He's just showing this contrast in the decisions you make. If you decide to be a wicked person, you'll get bad things. If you decide to be a righteous person, you're going to get all these good things over and over again. It's it's a very uh, clear way of showing that. The, the choice you make, the different, um, what you're going to uh, reap, what you sow. Okay, pretty simple. Okay. Okay, let's look at the amplified, I mean, KJV for the 14 now. A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth, and the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. I'll read it more slowly here. Let me see if you, you have an opinion on this. A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. Yeah, okay. I got my Bible with me now. Um, okay. That's just continuing the theme of uh, the power of the tongue. Yeah. And how important it is to say to uh, to say the right thing, uh, to be rewarded or say the wrong thing and uh, pay the price. Yeah. And then it goes on to say the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. And it also includes uh, not only uh, our tongue, but uh, the work of our hands as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say the first part of it uh, relates to, it contrasts the first part of the previous verse. Uh, in verse 13, it says, the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips. So if you're wicked and you're saying bad things, you're going to get caught. And the 14 says, but if you are if you have good fruit coming out of your mouth, then you're going to be satisfied with good things. Um, and, and now the the recompense, recompense of a man's hands <clears throat> Um, well, the recompense of our hands could be twofold. I mean, our, our hands could produce good things. Our, our hands could be destructive, too. So, so, uh, so what's going on here is the tongue and the hands are very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's possible to uh, do good or bad with our tongue and with our hands. Let's look at 14 in the Amplified. Uh, That's something. Okay. You want to elaborate? Well, that's that's something to uh to think about, really. Uh, how your uh, uh, your tongue and your hands are being compared here in the Proverbs, and how uh the fruit of your tongue and and the fruit of your hands are quite similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, he talks a lot in the future chapters about uh, the power of the tongue, uh, particularly the power of a woman's tongue. Uh, the, the, when a woman can say really cruel things and be very destructive uh, to her husband, uh, that'll come up later. But the tongue, uh, doesn't Paul say the tongue is a powerful member? Uh, you know, it's a, yeah. small, it's a very small little thing that, tip of our tongue that causes us, that allows us to speak. Uh, but uh, that little tip of our tongue uh, is super powerful. Look what Adolf Hitler did with his tongue. You know? Yeah, and we know that uh, 
the tongue just speaks out of the abundance of the heart. So we know it's a heart condition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, the tongue, what people say, can be very powerful, either for good or for bad. So, and the Amplified, it says, from the fruit of his words, a man shall be satisfied with good, and the work of a man's hands shall come back to him as a harvest. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people think that the working with their hands is really what the Bible is telling us to do, too. Uh, because, you know, there's, there's all kinds of labor. Uh, that what we're doing right now is a work. Um, we're, not, we're not doing this uh, Bible study because we feel obligated to do some good works. We know that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and religious work is not required for salvation. But nevertheless, this is a religious work that we're doing right now, studying and teaching the Bible. And, uh, but it's, a, it's almost not like work to us because it's such a pleasure to talk about the Bible and Jesus and have fellowship. Uh, but the, the work with one's hands, uh, there's something to be said about that. A lot of people think that that is the most, the most honorable type of work. So there are people who are called white collar workers and blue collar workers. The white collars are working more with their minds and their mouth, they're talking and they're thinking, come with ideas, they're managing people. The blue collars are doing physical labor. And uh, even Paul continued doing physical labor. You know, he, he continued working as a tent maker to earn his living so he did not have to uh, beg for money from the church, you know? So uh, what do you think about uh, working for a living with your hands versus with your, with your mind and mouth? Well, I've always worked with my mind uh, being a PLC programmer and uh, I've always been rewarded uh, well for it and uh respected well for it uh but uh uh this one job i was at uh that people didn't respect me uh they thought i was lazy because i could fix everything from my armchair mm -hmm. and so uh and they were out there they had to work hard because uh, all, all they knew how to do was uh, turn bolts but i could keep the plant running uh from the uh office and uh, they, they, uh, they didn't. Some people just don't respect you for that, and uh, some people yeah. do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's a, there's a also a kind of a conflicting mindset of, and class envy of people who are white collar versus blue collar workers, and I, I would say that uh, either way that it's honorable as long as it's honest work. Uh, you can be a hard worker like an auto mechanic that I mentioned earlier, but not honorable, and you're, you're dishonest and a thief. And, uh, and then you can be someone who's a white-collar person that is uh, a salesman and it is sell selling a good product with, in good conscience and selling it honestly, and there's virtue in that. But on the other hand, you could be a, a white-collar worker that's a salesman that's just a liar and a thief and that's one of the things that I was guilty of years ago. Uh, for many years, my job was basically being a professional liar. That's what I did for a living. I lied every day. And it was, uh, you know, after I got saved, immediately I had to stop. I couldn't, I couldn't do it in good conscience anymore. Uh, but I think both uh, white collar and blue, blue collar work it can be good or bad. It just depends on how you how you approach it. Let's go to uh, KJV now, verse uh, 15. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So here we have, a, again, 
probably hundreds of times we'll see the same contrast between a fool and a wise person. So the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. And others, fools, they don't even realize that they're being foolish. <laughs> Brother, do you, do you know any fools? Uh, yeah, uh, I've played the fool. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry to admit, I confess, I played the fool before I got saved and, and after I got saved. Uh, and that's why uh, we have the new covenant, because uh, when the dog returns to its vomit under the old covenant, it uh, breaks the old covenant. But it doesn't break the new covenant, thank God. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, I mean, not that I... I'm not capable of doing foolish things even today. Uh, uh, I, I think that I've learned over the years from mistakes. Um, I remember once my, I was trying to teach my son when he was a young man uh, some wise principles. And, and uh, he said to me, he, he wanted to do it his way. He said, he says, uh, uh, experience is the best teacher. In other words, if you learn from experience, you'll learn it better. But, but I said, well, number one, experience that way, learning that way, is a, it's a hard teacher. It's a hard school to go to. You have to learn the hard way. Sometimes you have bad experiences. You learn, but why learn the hard way? And I said, if you want to learn from experience, then learn from my experience and other people who've already gone through it, the experience instead of having to suffer from going through the school of hard knocks on your own, you know? Uh, so, um, I know a lot of fools. Um, by the way, my son has grown to be very wise. He's 35 years old. And he's uh, far wiser than I was at the age of 35. But um, um, I, I know a lot of fools, and, and they're fools... Even people who uh, I know who are highly educated and very successful financially, and yet I, I think that I see some real foolishness in them. They're foolish that they just blindly follow the, uh, the, the so-called science of Darwinism. They, they've never done what I said in that first uh, quotation I gave you, being skeptical. They're skeptical of the Bible. They're skeptical of God. They're skeptical of Christianity. But they just follow like a, a, a sheep, uh, and you know what they what they're told about Darwinism, and never are skeptical. And why don't they? Why don't they get skeptical about that and start asking hard questions about evolution? I mean, it's it's real easy. Just start asking questions about everything. Well, how did that happen? Oh, really? It just that just appeared here. I mean, with, and just as you ask enough questions, get skeptical. You'll find out that the, the theory is just full of holes, and it's and it's absurd, and it's it's no better than a fairy tale, like we were told when we were children. If I told you a little fairy tale, you'd probably laugh about it, you know. But if I tell you that uh, man gradually evolved little pieces of time over millions of years. Uh, you know, why not be skeptical of that? So I see people today, even people I know, people I see there are highly respected on the news. And this blindly accepting things and being, just, they're foolish. And they're not wise enough to, to say, let me challenge these things like global warming, Darwinism, instead of just accepting them because they think that some scientists are saying it's a fact. Uh, yeah, I believe uh, the Bible uh, says that they're willfully ignorant. And uh, I've talked to some of them, and uh, they've said that if we can uh, unite Christianity, uh, then they'll uh, uh, check us out. Uh, they'll they'll uh, 
But until then, they're just going to be willfully ignorant uh, because they see what's going on in Christianity, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, the, 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 the worst advertisement for Christianity are Christians. <laughs> yeah, I think the main problem is the false gospels that are ruining it. If we could get rid of that... Uh, we'll be way ahead of the game. And I, I think that we can, biblically, uh, there's a way. And I'm working on the, the process, uh, get it approved by my lawyers uh -huh. uh, bef before we implement it. Yeah. Well, I made a video, uh, the top five reasons people reject Christianity. And this is this kind of part of that problem, that uh, people look at people who are claiming to be Christians and they look at them and they see hypocrisy and, and uh, when you're particularly if your your theology is lordship and saying you've got to do this and you got to do that and they see that anybody can see that that person hasn't done done all those things themselves nobody nobody has done it nobody has uh, can become perfect and so uh, they, that hypocrisy turns a lot of people away from Christianity uh, See, that's a very good example right there of how false gospel is uh, damning uh, people to hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so fools uh, are all around us, and it's amazing. A person can be very educated and very successful, and yet quite a fool. Uh, the ways the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkeneth unto counsel is wise. So it gets back to okay, if you're a fool, stop being a fool and being listen listen to counseling. My counsel to the fools right now is um, be skeptical of Darwinism. Uh, start asking questions. Start studying the other sides of the argument. Uh, and I, I said, I have another video titled, Please Don't Be, don't be Ignorant. Ignorant is not, a, um, um, it's not an insult because we're all ignorant. Everyone's ignorant because <clears throat> only God has complete knowledge. Uh, even the most knowledgeable person in the world, he doesn't even, Einstein says he doesn't even know 1% of nothing. So... Uh, we're all ignorant of so much of, of what is real and the truth, and yet uh, uh, when it comes to creation in the Bible versus Darwinism, uh, most people just blindly accept Darwinism, and they've never they they do not take the time to study the other side, and therefore they're ignorant. Almost every person is ignorant about the arguments against Darwinism. And, and uh, they, they could never defend Darwinism. All they can just say, say is, oh, come on, you're, you're not one of those flat earthers, are you? Everybody knows it's, it's a science, a scientific fact of Darwinism. They just accept it. But they're, they're foolish. They're not uh, challenging it. And so they should listen to, it says here, hearkeneth unto wise counsel. And my counsel to, to them would be, study the other side. That's what, what I said in the beginning. It says, it says, it says, we have nothing to lose but the errors we hold. Are you willing to study uh, the arguments against Darwinism? Study the arguments for creationism and, and, and open your mind up and consider it. And, and you'll find out that Darwinism is not proven at all. It's a far-fetched, weird concept that anybody that is just so... Uh, ridiculous that uh, it, it's amazing to me people have just accepted it so blindly oh, okay uh, that's verse 15 uh, let's look at verse 16 a fool's wrath is presently known but a prudent man covereth shame A fool's wrath is presently known, but a prudent man covereth shame. Okay, brother, I need your help for this one. 
Okay, well, the first half is very uh, simple, and I can easily address that. Uh, a fool's wrath is presently known. Uh, well, you know, I'm German, and uh, um, I've got a little bit of a temper. And uh, thank God uh, I've been born again, because uh, that temper would have destroyed me by now uh, if I hadn't been born again. Okay. That's <laughs> funny to me because uh, I never would have thought that you had a temper. Well, yeah, and uh, thank God uh, it's not a problem for me uh, when I'm walking in the spirit. Yeah. So. <laughs> but but if, if you're walking in the flesh, we don't want to be around you then, is what you're saying. Uh, yeah, probably. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Well, uh, so what about the uh, second part of that verse now? Uh, well, you take the second part. I'm not quite sure how to make what to make of that. Okay, I'm going to go to the Amplified and see if it helps me. A fool's wrath is quickly and openly known, but a prudent man ignores an insult. Oh, okay. Okay, that's that's uh, that certainly would be prudent. Yes, that would uh, also tie in with the first half of the verse. Yeah, yeah, I've had to deal with that a lot over the years in ministry. Uh, I've been out there uh, preaching on the streets. Uh, you know, sometimes people. They hate the, they hate the name Jesus. They hate the Bible. They hate God even generically, and and uh, they so therefore they hate me because I'm praising Jesus and teaching people about salvation. And some people have gotten very angry with me over the years and uh, threatened violence on me. And and uh, uh, I've been spit on, things thrown at me. Nobody's ever taken a swing at me. I've almost lost it. A couple of times, I almost lost <laughs> physically and, and got violent on them. But uh, uh, I'm thankful that that uh, I I always bear in mind that even when I'm talking to one person, normally there's three or hundred or four hundred other people around observing. And especially if someone gets loud. Then the, then the crowd g gathers and they watch this and the, dr the drama. And people have seen that people have been uh, uh, really um, aggressive and uh, a borderline of violence on me. And, and I, I've remained peaceful and, and uh, I've given them a soft answer. They're, the Proverbs, there's a verse that says, a soft answer turneth away wrath. And so uh, that's that's what the second half of that verse is. A prudent man, uh, you know, uh, does not uh, respond to that anger. Let me see, it's, how's, it, how's it phrased? Uh, a prudent man ignores an insult. It's not easy. You have to be in the spirit, brother, as you said. If you get in the flesh, then, then you re respond in kind. And uh, people who get ugly with you, you end up getting ugly back. And then, and then we have people saying, look, look at that Christian over there, that preacher. He's no better than that other guy. The other guy was calling him names and cursing at him, and now he's cursing back at him. He, the Christian's no better. Those, hypocrite, those Christians are such hypocrites. That's, that's what you have. That's what you get. Okay. Yeah, and you see it a lot. See it a lot on YouTube too. Yeah, yeah. I made a video about that kind of conduct called "Ambassadors to Christ." Really? Uh, because if we are, if we are truly ambassadors to Christ, an ambassador is representing Him well. Uh, we're not representing Christ when we start getting angry and yelling, raising our voice and cursing at people and, and calling them names. And uh, uh, but we're ambassadors when we're when we're uh, showing responding the way Jesus responds and and showing love. The only time Jesus 
really let people have it was the religious hypocrites. Remember them, the Pharisees? Yeah, uh, I think you know that uh, when you said uh, that we uh, respond in love, if we always keep the one commandment we're commanded to keep, we won't go wrong. Yeah, yeah. That's why I love the verse uh, when Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Uh, I've come to understand that verse, I think, recently, that uh, being yoked to Jesus, uh, that's, that's when we believe in him and our spirit and the Holy Spirit are united and we're born again. We're yoked. It's easy. All we got to do is put our faith in Jesus and that happens. And then once we're yoked to him, though, what kind of burden are we, does he put it under? Not, not religious bondage. The only thing he asks of us, he says, will you just please love each other? That's all I'm going to require or, or ask of you. To just love each other, will you? It's not always easy to love everybody. The wizard, brother. Well, I wouldn't say that it's not easy. I haven't struggled with it uh, because uh, the Lord taught me how to love. And it was a difficult lesson, but after the lesson uh, was over with, now uh, I find it easy to love uh, even my worst enemies. Uh, yeah. I guess I've uh, been blessed. Uh, well, what I say, it's not always easy. I'm not necessarily applying it to you or me personally. Uh, personally, I, uh, uh, I feel like you do. It's, it's not a big burden for me. I mean, I, I can love people, and uh, even, even in the worst circumstances, I still don't, it doesn't turn to hatred. But uh, it's, apparently it's not easy be, because so many people who are believers do not do that. They, they do not respond with love. They respond the wrong way. So uh, as a group, of, when we look at Christians as a group, it doesn't seem to be always that easy to just simply love each other, does it? No, and it's a problem we've we've got to address. Uh, it's got to be fixed. Uh, if if everybody just uh, kept the one commandment we were commanded to keep after they come to Christ, uh, I think we could get so much more accomplished. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, brother. Now let's go to the next verse. It's uh, uh, verse 16, I think. Uh, If, no, I said that one all right. Uh, but I put it in uh, Verse 70 is what we're in. He that speaketh truth showeth forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Uh, that's, that's pretty straightforward, I think, right? Uh, uh, speak the truth, don't lie. Um, verse 18, there is that, there is that speaketh like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Yeah. Um, it just shows you the power of words. Uh, when people say horrible things, it hurts people. Words do hurt. You know, you can, you can say sticks and stones will break my bone, may break my bones, but names and faces will never hurt me. But that's not true. I, I know that I've been hurt by things that people have said. And uh, I know that <laughs> I, I've hurt people. And sometimes I've hurt the people I love the most by saying things that I regret now. So this is really talking just about the power of, of words. I mean, if you are... Um, uh, it says the tongue of the wise is health. If you're a wise person, you're going to be saying good things that, that uh, not only help people, it's a blessing to people, but, but it, it's, it's also probably go, even helpful to you to be encouraging and positive and hopeful rather than saying things that pierce people like a sword. I mean, have you ever said anything or has anybody said anything that, that pierced you like a sword? Oh, it happens all the time. Uh, but you know what? Uh, 
Uh, it's not it's not so bad when you're in Christ. So uh, they can say th things all the time. You know, you just uh, the best thing you can do is tell them the gospel, and uh, that's the solution to all their problems. And that's the greatest love we can offer them is to tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any greater love than that. We're we're laying down our lives to give them the gospel. That's the greatest love uh, a man can have for uh, another. And uh, we're offering them the greatest gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but saying kind things, the gospel is the kindest thing of all. Because it's the good news about eternal life in heaven. I mean, we're telling them how, how they can go to heaven freely. I mean, that's the, that's the most positive, wonderful thing that you can ever say to someone. But there are other nice things that we can say to people. I mean, I, I've made it a habit of, of trying to compliment people in my life uh, whenever possible. Uh, but I don't want to be, as Proverbs uh, also criticizes, be a flatterer. The flatterer is someone who's just trying to flatter people, but it's, not, but it's insincere. Um, like uh, what I said, to you, I said something to you earlier that was a nice thing to say, but it was sincere. And uh, I, was, I talked about how I thought that you are a wise person. And uh, it, um, I, had, I met a new doctor yesterday, and uh, uh, I, I noticed a couple things about him that I really liked, and I told him. Uh, but they were sincere. But I'm not going to tell someone that uh, you know a compliment and that is is not sincere. If, if they're uh, let's say overweight, you know, really say horribly overweight, I'm not going to say, "Oh, you, you, you look you look fantastic." <laughs> that would be insincere. But I, I might be I might be able to to, to say. You know, you've got a wonderful smile. I said that to the nurse, by the way. She had a wonderful smile. When I first met her, she smiled. And when people smile at me, it's like giving me a wonderful blessing. But I wanted her to know that I was blessed, that your, your smile has just made me feel great. And I really appreciate your, your smile. So there's a lot of nice things we can say that are actually help people. You know, it's healthy for them and for us. And then there's horrible things that are injurious, that pierce like a sword. And I've been pierced, and I know that I've been guilty of it myself, saying horrible things to people. And uh, help me, Jesus, I, I don't want to do, do that again, ever again. Okay, let's uh, go to uh, verse 19. The lip of truth shall be established forever. But a lying tongue is but for a moment. Hmm. Never thought about that before. That's interesting. In other words, the truth is eternal, and a lie is not eternal. <laughs> you ever thought about that? That's amazing. You, on the surface, it looks pretty... Uh pretty uh straightforward and uh uh common sense but uh, i'm kind of thinking well there's, there's something more going on here that we're not seeing uh because it's pre it seems pretty obvious to me now i know that's talking about jesus christ uh -huh. well uh, and it's talk yeah it's talking about the word of god uh-huh Uh, truthful lips. Uh, I think it's. I think it's talking about when we say truthful things. The truth is established forever, but when we lie, the lie only lasts for a moment. Well, for a moment. I mean, a lie. A lie can be last for uh, you know years and you know, have an effect for a long time. But but compared to eternity, a, a year is just a moment. Uh, but let's look at it in the in the amplified. Oh, I did. Truthful lips shall be established forever. 
But a lying tongue is credited, but for a moment. Hmm. All right, let's go to verse 20 in the KJV. Uh, deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. But to the counselors of peace is joy. Yeah. Well, if someone's evil, you wouldn't expect them to be honest, right? They would be deceitful. Uh, but the counselors of, of peace is joy. Yeah. There's, a, I think, verses in the, coming up to in Proverbs that says, um, uh, peace like a river and joy like a fountain. I've always loved that. Uh, uh, so peace and joy are uh, kind of related, too, you know. Uh, with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah, Jesus said, uh, my joy I give unto you. And that joy uh, is one of the things we receive uh, when we come to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah, we get, uh, he gives us peace and, and joy. Peace, I guess peace because uh, we don't have to, we can rest and be confident and don't have to worry. It's nice to not have to worry about, um, well, in our lifetime, we're not supposed to worry because God will provide our needs. And after life, in, the, in eternity, we, we are, we're promised eternal life in heaven. So we should have peace. We should not be stressed and worrying. Uh, and then that, 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 in turn, should give us joy. And uh, I don't see, that's another thing that I see lacking a lot in Christianity is, is this peace and joy that we're supposed to have. Uh, uh, 21, there shall no evil happen to the just but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. Well, what do you think of that? There shall no evil happen to the just. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I don't know how to answer that. What do you think about that? Um, well, my first reaction is that that's not true, but we know it is true. Uh, but it's, do we, we just don't understand it, uh, I guess, because the way I see it, um, uh, evil happens to uh, save people all the time. I mean, um, and they, people talk about the tribulation, you know, well, guess what? If you think there's some seven-year tribulation off in the future, uh, I got news for you. Uh, we, we, the church has always been in tribulation since they killed Stephen, the first martyr. They've killed all the people of the early church and then all through history. And even today, all over the world, Christians are being killed and persecuted. We have been in tribulation and persecution all along, all through church history. So I have seen evil happen to the church when, when it says the just, uh, it's not just talking about just people who we think are pretty good people. You know, that's it. That's another question. One of my doctors, my surgeon, uh, here's a good story, brother. Uh, uh, I've known my surgeon now for, uh, it's been over 11 months ago since I had my surgeries. And I still have follow-ups with the surgeon. And uh, last Friday, he, uh, he said, why your wife? He has to your appointments. Because uh, my wife used to come to all my appointments with me. I said, well, she's been out of town for six weeks, and she's supposed to get back, to, get back next week. And, and he said, well, what do you do with all your spare time? 
<laughs> and, and thankfully, uh, I have a good answer for that. I said, well, I, I spend a lot of time doing a Christian ministry work on the Internet. And you see, now, if I wasn't doing that, I wouldn't have had a chance to witness to him. But, see, if you're busy doing ministry, and then people ask you the most common question, what's the most common question a person asks you if they haven't seen you for a while? They say, hey, what have you been up to? <laughs> what have you been doing? Well, if you, if you haven't been doing any ministry work, then it's not natural for you to say, well, I've been talking a lot about Jesus and teaching the Bible. But if you've been busy doing the Lord's work, people will say, well, what have you been doing all your time? How are you keeping yourself busy? I said, I'm, I'm doing Christian ministry work. Um, and so I told him about my channel, and he had a lot of questions. But one question he had was the common, the big objection, the big objection. And that's, what about all the bad things that happen to good people? If there's a God, why do bad things happen to good people? And we know that is a fact. Uh, and yet, no one is good. We all fall short of the glory of God. So if, if, if people don't look at it from a, a biblical viewpoint, they think that some people are, are good and some people are not so good. So, um, uh, but God says none of us are really good. That's why Jesus said to the man, why do you call me good? Only God is good. No, there's not one man that's good. Uh, we only get goodness or righteousness when we put our faith in Jesus, and then we get credit for his goodness, his righteousness. But without that, no one is really good. But when, we, when the people look at the world, they look at people and they evaluate them and say, well, I think he's a really good person, or he's a pretty good person, or he's not so good, or he's really bad. They, if, if you compare people to each other, then there are it's relative. There's degrees of goodness and badness in people in man's sight. But in God's sight, we're all like filthy rags in God's sight. So one answer to the question is uh, there's no bad that happens to good people because no one's good. And yet, I also know that uh, Christians are, have, are righteous because of Christ, and bad things happen to Christians. I didn't answer his question because were, I'm in an office visit, and there wasn't a lot of time allowed, but he promised he would be going to my, uh, my YouTube channel and checking it out. So, and maybe he's watching this, this today, or maybe he's, he'll see this at some point in time. But it is uh, it, it is good. What is the verse there? I forgot what even got me started on that. Uh, the verse is, uh, oh, there shall no evil happen to the just. So my point is that that, that doesn't seem to be true to me because um, bad things do happen to Christians and to other people that people think are good people. Bad things happen. So uh, that verse cannot mean that there shall no evil happen to the just. Let's see what it says in the Amplified. Maybe, hopefully it'll help us. It says, no actual evil, misfortune, or calamity shall come upon the righteous. No actual. <laughs> oh, well, that's one way out of, the, out of the problem. Say no actual evil, but I'm not, I'm not satisfied with that. It says, but the wicked shall be filled with evil, misfortune, and calamity. Well, well I like your explanation. Mm -hmm. All right, brother. Let's go on to uh, verse uh, 22. Uh, lying lips are abomination to the Lord, um, but they that deal truly are his delight. They that deal truly are his delight. That's great. You know, there's really not much to be said. It's just saying don't lie. God doesn't like it when we lie. Uh, we shouldn't like it. We should not be happy, and we should not lie so easily. Brother, I remember 
I don't know, it wasn't that many years ago. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to another doctor's appointment, probably, I don't know, this, this has to be back maybe seven, year, eight years ago. So at this point, I'm, I'm a Christian, well into my Christianity in 20 years. And I'm getting in the car, getting ready to go see a doctor. And I'm thinking what I'm going to tell the doctor, I was going to make up some lie to tell the doctor about something. I don't remember the circumstances. But instead of telling the truth about something, I was making a plan to lie. And it dawned on me, wow, why am I doing this? Uh, why don't I just tell the doctor the truth or not talk about it at all? Is it a, but lying still, 20 years as a Christian, and lying still is so natural for me. It just came naturally. And uh, it made me reevaluate the, the, that way of thinking and try to try to uh, overcome that. And, and, and even something like uh, someone asked you, uh, um, to, uh, do, you, do you want to go to the, the can you, let's go to the movies or something. And instead of, a lot of people just make up a, a, a little lie, a little white, white lie, so they, they don't have to go. What's wrong with just saying, no, I'm, I'm just really not in the mood to go, or I have something else I want to do, but instead of saying, no, I have other plans, or, or I don't know, whatever it is. But people make up little white lies all the time instead of just saying the truth. We, we, we lie so easily. It's human nature to lie. It's my sin nature. And my... The, the Holy Spirit hasn't completely changed me in that way, but uh, I think uh, that in the last seven years, though, I, I have come a long ways. I, I don't lie as nat naturally. I, matter of fact, I I can't think of a lie le recently. So I, I, maybe I I am getting better. Okay. Uh, hopefully, Eric. We'll be back. I lost him. We'll see if he comes back. Brother Eric. Um, a prudent man concealeth knowledge, but the heart of the fool proclaimeth foolishness. So you don't have to tell people everything you know all the time and brag about how much you know. Uh, and uh, and uh, if you do want to do that, if you always want to talk about yourself and act like you know it all, then you'll really end up being perceived as a fool. Verse 24, the hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. Okay, so be diligent. Be a hard worker. Don't be lazy. You'll end up in, you know, being under tribute or, let me see, 24 in the Okay, in the Amplified, the hand of the diligent will rule, but the slothful will be put, put to forced labor. Wow. Okay. Uh, heaviness in the heart of man maketh it stoop, but a good word maketh it glad. Yeah, when you're sad, it just, it just it can be crushing. Uh, that's why if someone's sad, let's try to encourage them. Uh, I know that... Uh, I felt this heaviness, and sometimes a smile from someone, an encouraging word, just is, is, is medicine. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduces them. Don't be seduced by wicked people. Don't listen to them. Uh, you know, be, be strong and, and stand against them. Don't follow people into wickedness. Uh, the slothful man roasteth not that which he took in hunting, but the, the substance of a diligent man is precious. This slothful person that here we're encountering is going to uh, come up quite often. Uh, and um, uh, Solomon has this contrast between being diligent, being lazy, being foolish, being wise, being honest, being deceitful, and uh, showing you this, this contrast as a teaching tool, show you that choose, 
If you choose to be honest, you're going to get good things back to you. If you choose to be dishonest, you'll have to suffer consequences. And, and one of the themes that now we're talking about is slothfulness, which means laziness. Don't be lazy. If you be lazy, you'll suffer the consequences. You won't have a, a fruitful life. But if you're diligent, if you're hardworking, it will pay off. And the final verse is, in the way of the righteousness, the way of righteousness is life, in the pathway, therefore, and in the pathway there, thereof, there is no death. Okay. Well, this, in verse 28, righteousness and life, and uh, contrasting it with no righteousness being death, and that leads me perfectly into the conclusion of every one of these studies, and that is, how do you get righteousness? How do you get life everlasting? You, you know, the scripture tells us that it is appointed for man once to die, and then the judgment. Uh, it, it, we don't have to get very old at all before we learn about death. Even as small children, we first are taught that someday everybody dies. And uh, so, but at, the scripture says, we all die, but then we get judged by God. And are, are you ready to be judged by God? If you died right now, God said to you, why should I let you in heaven? What will you say? I'll tell you, almost everybody answers the question, and this is worldwide. Members of all the religions of the world, they all answer the question the same way. What would you say to God if he said, why should I let you into heaven? And people say, well, God, I think I'm a pretty good person. Uh, I, I've tried to be moral and upright and honest. In fact, I even followed the golden rule. And your commandments, I, I followed them as much as I could. Uh, and uh, I go to church. I'm a member of a religion. I, I, I pay tithes. I, I uh, give to charities. I confess to the priest. I take communion. I light candles. I pray five times a day on a rug, and I even went I made a trip to Mecca. I do all these things. See, you could be the most religious person in the world and plead your case to God, but if it's I, 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 if you're tr telling God all the things that you did, that's like when Jesus said, many will come to me that day and say, Lord, Lord, look at the wonderful things I did in your name. All the wonderful works I did in your name. Even if you're doing it in the name of Jesus, if you're, if you're counting on getting to heaven because of all the good things you did, Jesus' answer is, depart from me, worker of iniquity, I never knew you. So if you think you're going to go to heaven because you're a pretty good person, and you've got good enough so you qualify. You've met the test. You've, you've uh, gotten good enough so God will be satisfied with you, get you into heaven. Well, the scriptures say that no one is righteous, not even one. It says the righteousness of man is like filthy rags in the sight of God. The Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. The standard is perfection. It's not, I'm a pretty good person. Perfection is the standard. Jesus said, go and be perfect, just as our Father in heaven is perfect. And uh, there's only one person that's ever lived up to that standard. That's Jesus Christ. We all fall short of the glory of God. Jesus Christ is the glory of God. So let's say this is Jesus. He's perfect. And we all work in our best, doing our best, and we're all falling short. And some better, some not, some not as good. But we all fall short because nobody's perfect. Well, then that means we can't go to heaven. You've got to be perfect. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Scripture says that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that's Jesus, that whosoever believeth in him, whoever believes in Jesus, will not perish, we will not go into hell, into the lake of fire, the second death. But instead, we'll have everlasting life in heaven. Because we believe in Jesus. We believe in him. So 
That God tells us that he loves us so much. That's you and me, all of mankind. He loves us that much. He gave us a son. Now, Jesus is God. And he said he came down from heaven. He says he became a man. And he said he did it for one reason, to give his life as a ransom. Jesus became a man so that he could die, give his life. He died on a cross as a ransom. No, a ransom means it's a payment made to set someone free. Jesus died so that we could be set free from a guilty judgment. And, and he died on the cross. He paid for your sins and my sins. So all of our sins are paid for. So now you don't have to plead your case to God at the judgment and say, well, I, I know I sinned, but I get a lot of good stuff. For, don't plead your case like that. Jesus paid for your sins. Your sin, sin is not the issue now. The issue now is God says, why shall I let you into heaven? You say, nothing in my hand I bring. I have nothing to offer. Simply to the cross I cling. Jesus, on that cross, he died for my sins. I'm trusting in Jesus. Jesus promises eternal life in heaven to everyone who trusts him for it. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the Son of God. He's God in the flesh. He's the Savior. He died for our sins so that we could have life. But the good news is he's alive again. He raised himself from the dead. He said he would raise himself from the dead in advance. They said, give us a sign of who you are, you're making all these claims that you're the son of God. Prove it. He says, I'll raise myself from the dead after three days. And he did. By raising himself from the dead and walking for 40 days and talking and touching and eat, touching people and eating with people for 40 days, hundreds of people, eyewitnesses. He proved he is God. He has the power over life and death. And he says he will give you life everlasting in heaven if you just believe in him. Don't believe that he's just a historical person and he really existed. You believe in him to save you. No longer will you plead your case. Look what I've done. Look what I've done. You reject that and say, I've been a failure. I've not been perfect. But Jesus is my Savior. I'm trusting him. So we don't plead our good works to God. We plead the blood, the sacrifice that Jesus died for our sins. If you do, if, if that's where your faith is, if your faith is in Jesus to save you instead of your faith in yourself to earn heaven, that's when he gives you eternal life. And he says, it's irrevocable. He says, no one will ever pluck you out of his hand. He will never leave you or forsake you. In no way will he ever cast you out. So once you put your faith in Jesus, you get eternal life promised and it, it'll, he'll never change his mind no matter what you do after that. Isn't that good news? That's why it's called the gospel. That's a Greek word that means good news. I think it should be translated as the greatest news ever. And then when you understand this and you received it, you received salvation from, from Jesus as a free gift. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. He's offering you the gift of eternal life. When you receive it, you'll have it. peace like a river and joy like a fountain. Do it now if you've never done it before. Call on the name of the Lord. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying for my sins. I believe in you, and I, I, I know that you're giving me eternal life. Thank you, Jesus. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.